Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 155, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Howard Prusak of High Meadows Farm raises crops, potted herbs, and vegetable starts with his wife, Lisa, in 30,000 square feet of greenhouses, as well as out in the field in Putney, Vermont. Howard has been farming since 1971, and High Meadows Farm was the first certified organic farm in Vermont. We dig into Howard's history and the growth of the farm, Howard's early off-farm job and how that helped him learn the business, and the logistics of marketing to retailers. Howard also shares his tips about transplant production, training employees to water plants in the greenhouse. Wow, I know that's a hard one. And the overseas education work that he has done. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by Farmer's Web, software for your farm. Farmer's Web makes it easier to work with your buyers, saving time, reducing errors, and increasing your capacity to work with more buyers overall. Farmer's Web. Dot com. And by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. And by BCS America. BCS two wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear driven and built to last for decades of dependable service, BCS America. Dot com. Howard Prusak, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Oh, thank you. Good morning. And hello, America and all the ships at sea. <laughs> <laughs> you were just telling me how beautiful it is there in Vermont this morning. It is. It's like living in a Curia and Ives painting. Um, we just had a nice fresh eight inch snow fall overnight, really nice white fluffy stuff. And the sun's up and the sky's blue and the snow is is bright and all the trees are covered with, with snow. Yeah, it's like it's like really is like living in, in a postcard. We, we joke that we get paid in scenery here, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we try to balance it out <laughs> with, with real money. <laughs> now, High Meadows Farm is located near Putney, Vermont. Where in the great state of Vermont is Putney? Okay, well, it's southern Vermont. Uh, I actually live in Westminster but uh, my mailing address is Putney, and it's easier to say Putney than it is. I actually live in Westminster West, and it's like it's too long. Um, but we actually do live in Westminster, but our mail, we, we call it Putney because we're closer to Putney. So it's exit four on the highway coming into Putney. So it's on the corner of three states, uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont. And, and that's so it's the southeast corner, if you look on the map. Brattleboro is the big town. Uh, all of 10,000 people just south of us, and we're we're about 20 minutes north in the hills. We're 900 foot elevation, which isn't a lot for Vermont, um, but you know it's not sea level either. So we're rolling hills. We're not. I don't have. Um, and this isn't a river farm. Uh, we have some flat fields. Most of the fields kind of roll and tilt, and one way and the other. Uh, sometimes it's it's challenging, and I've learned to deal with it after 40-something years. We have rocks and stones. I spent a long time pulling all the boulders out, but every once in a while, as one pops up, they, they reproduce themselves, we think. And uh, so that, that's always a fun fun job we do every year. We're always sort of doing that. I started farming in 1971, started working just up the road, uh, eighth of a mile from here. I came up for the summer and uh, I started working on one of the first commercial organic farms. It's called Nature Farms, not pretentious at all, right? Right. <laughs> and um, I just never left. And two years later, that farm went out of business and I took over the lease arrangements and uh, I started working it. And then about Eight years after that, Farm Next Door came up for sale, and I was able to buy it. I got a mortgage from uh, Farmer's Home, as it used to be called then, uh, under a new policy that President Jimmy Carter uh, initiated, um, limited resource program for new farmers. It was specifically for new farmers to be able to get onto the land, because then as now, uh, it was very expensive and almost impossible for new farmers to get uh, credit and to buy land and the necessary equipment. I was turned down by Sears for a credit card, uh, just to give you an idea of, of how hard it was <laughs> back 
the 70s. They said my income wasn't reliable, and it was like, duh, you know, uh, okay. But, you know, it's never, no one ever said my, I, I never paid my bills. But anyway, that was, that was <laughs> that's what it was like. So I was, I, I got, actually, I was the first organic farm in the nation to get a mortgage through FHA, uh, through the program. And, um, I, I'll have a mortgage burning come, uh, this summer. I'll be done after 40 years. Yeah. I made it, made it to the end. Um, and maybe they'll give me a gold watch, right? That's right. I, I don't know what I get. Uh, you know, I'll probably get a thing stamp paid uh, and that'll be it. Um, but, but that'll be exciting. 40 years of, of mortgage payments and, uh, I'll, I'll be done. And then, uh, I'll be all my equipment to actually be paid off about the same time or maybe during the following fall. And I'll be essentially outside of my taxes, clear of external debt pretty much. Yeah. So we're, you know, it, it's all worked out. Nothing is easy, but I, you know, there were always setbacks. There were periods where you couldn't, there was no market for organic produce uh, back in the, uh, some periods in the seventies and early eighties. And lots of times I just had to sell my, my produce as uh, produce, commercial stuff, and get the regular price. Um, but I started doing farmer's markets. I helped start our Brattleboro Farmer's Market in 1974. And um, so we started doing retail. Then I opened up my own farm stand in Brattleboro. Uh, the following year, I rented a, a used car lot and the carport, and I started, uh, I set up a little farm stand there right on a major road, U.S. Route 5. And um, I did that for quite a few years. I eventually bought real estate on Putney Road, Route 5, and I built a, quite a progressive modern farm market uh, with an attached greenhouse, uh, slate floors. It was, it was pretty fancy. It was way ahead of its time. Had a wine and beer license, uh, open every day of the year. We sold Christmas trees and, and plants and flowers and produce and all that stuff. So it was it was a quite an interesting business. And I sold that eventually, went back to uh, farming. Uh, I spent eight years while I was farming as a uh, uh, sales rep for New England for a bunch of natural food companies, uh, mostly organic, Lundberg Farms, uh, traditional tea company, a uh, bunch of companies that I, I'm sure everybody have, has heard of, Amy's Frozen Foods. And it was, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot about marketing. I got to travel to California, visit these companies, and these uh, where they make the food and where they grew the food. And I learned how to uh, deal with Whole Foods because they were one of my prime accounts. So I learned the ins and outs of dealing with them. And uh, gradually, I started making sales to them uh, from my own produce, and I was able to segue out of that job uh, into back into full-time farming, and I had a sort of a ready-to-go market base, and from there, uh, we expanded and stopped putting up more greenhouses. Now we have 10 greenhouses, about 30,000 square feet of heated greenhouse space, and we grow primarily, uh, number one crop is potted herbs, um, followed by vegetable starts, and uh, we, we run... That's our business for about half of the year uh, are all these plants. We have our own trucks. We do all of our own deliveries uh, into four different states. Um, so we have uh, two drivers, a uh, crew here running uh, transplanting and seeding and all that, that stuff. We actually had 19 employees last year, not including myself and my wife. So it's a pretty big, pretty big business. We make a living from it. Um, and we pay people, and we've got two people who are, who are actually going on a year-round salary uh, starting uh, when we get back from our vacation in Costa Rica. So uh, taking care of our staff has always been a priority, paying a living wage. We pay, we do pay more than most farms in the area. We only employ local people, um, and, we're, and we're proud of that. Uh, I don't make a big deal out of it, but I, I always felt, you know, farms – one of the things we all were always telling our customers in stores, oh, buy local. You know, you need need to buy local and sustainable farms. And then I find out, well, these 
these people who say that, but they're not hiring local. They might be bringing in uh, temporary workers from out of the country. Um, and I would say, well, how sustainable is that? And how is that being local? And you can't talk the talk. You really got to walk the walk. And one of the things I we hire local people. And in turn, I tell my local customers, buy from us because we're hiring your sons and daughters to work here. And um, I think it's a valid argument. It's a good argument. And that's the one I have. So I go with it. <laughs> um, yeah, well, which segues into another thing of, of you got to have a story. A farmer has to know his story. It's like, well, why should I buy, you know, zucchini from you and not Jake from down the road? Well, here's my story. And I'm, I like telling my story. I'm enthusiastic about the story. Uh, we were Vermont's first certified organic farm, which makes us one of the early ones in New England and one of the earliest in the country. Not the earliest, but we're there. Uh, NOFA Vermont started on our farm. Um, we've, I've had a lot of people who've worked here, have went on and moved around the country and started various farms of their own. Uh, businesses in the produce business, uh, one of the largest organic produce distribution firms in San Francisco, uh, the women used to work for me. And uh, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm proud of the history and, um, and and the different things that we've learned, the different methods, because when we started, there was no manual or book or hardly any of like how to do what we were doing. How do you do this stuff organically? Well, we had the Encyclopedia of Organic Farming and gar Gardening from Rodale, and that was that pretty much constituted 90% of what anybody knew uh, about organics uh, back then. And but we had a network of other friends and farmers throughout Vermont and New England, and we would talk and get together, and that's how NOFA started actually through uh, through meetings. Uh, and we also started a, a co-op movement uh, because we needed the things that we needed and there was no way to get it economically or even get it. I mean, we were buying, uh, we used to, we were cooking natural foods in the seventies for a lot of people. We needed a sauce of soy sauce and five gallon cans and honey and Hey, brown rice. Well, where do you buy brown rice? <laughs> Not, it wasn't available. So we were bringing it in and, and, and contracting, uh, wheat, uh, from organic wheat farms. And we put together these contacts all over the country and that's, um, how Northeast Co-op sort of got off the ground there, which was eventually bought by United Natural Foods, UNFI, which is the largest organic natural food distributor in the world now. Um, and anyway, everything has every, everything started somewhere, that, and that's my point. But farmers need to know their story, know their roots, and know what they're selling. And you're not always it's not it's not about the zucchini, or about the onion. It's really about you. It's about the farm. It's about the soil. It's about what you do. You know. So I see these people. You know, they're pricing and they try to underprice the next person and the other farm. And you know, I, I call it a race to the bottom, and it's a race I don't want to win. All right, um, I am not. You know, cheap is a state of mind, and, and, you know, do you really want cheap food or do you want good food? And what does that really mean? And what about the term of value? Does cheap food have a value or does, does good food have a, have a unique value of its own? So this is part of uh, my story, and it should be part of every farmer's toolkit of marketing ideas. And I, I, uh, some people get it and, and some people don't. I, I see some people just, you know, constantly wringing their hands and, and, oh, you know, the guy, someone else is selling it cheaper, and so i got to beat him or I'm not selling stuff. Hey, here's a tip. Don't don't grow what doesn't sell. I, I know it may sound radical, <laughs> but, but um, one thing I was, I was taught, and I learned, I was lucky when I started back in the 70s, there were still a lot of old farmers around. Uh, some had recently retired, a lot of old vegetable farmers. And we used to joke, hey, we're not going to make a living till all these old guys you know, finally die off so we could, you know, have the market to ourselves. But, you know, we learn so much from these guys and, and women. And one of the, one of the early things that one of the smartest old timers market gardeners told me, he looked and says, you know, grow, grow the stuff that sells, you know, and, and it's as, it's as radical now as it was, you know, when he told me that in 1973 and it was like, Oh, okay. You know, grow what sells. I, I like that idea. So I started growing a lot of tomatoes because people seem to be buying tomatoes. And um, so you go, 
you go where what where the customers lead you. Things evolve. Uh, you know, you can have the best, most detailed business plan in the world, and I say by by day two, half of that's in the garbage. Um, business takes a life of its own, and it kind of evolves in the way that it just evolves if you're paying attention. Uh, what you should always do is pay attention to the standard business uh, practices of maintaining the financial integrity of basically more money needs to be coming in than going out. There's, there's rule one. If you nail that down, <laughs> you, you're going to do all right, you know. And and, and those are the, the simple things that I I I, I learned early, early on. And hard work will have its own rewards. Growing good produce, if you grow really good produce or good fruit or anything, it will find a market, all right? We've learned to prepare the market. When I got back into this uh, full-time, one of the rules I told myself, um, I don't want to take away business from any other existing farmer. That wasn't what I wanted to do. I really wanted to chart a new path and what I saw that I can offer to the to the retail stores um, that we were going to be selling to is we weren't going to be cannibalizing other sales. It wasn't like we were making bread and here's our bread. We're going to steal sales from this other guy's bread. We had a new product. We had potted organic herb plants that we were going to deliver weekly. They'll be fresh. All they had to do was water them. Uh, we would We would remove the dead ones, credit them, and it was a whole new, whole new ball game. And much to their surprise, these stores started making money in a whole new category that they didn't, they never even had before. Uh, some stores didn't have a floral department or anything, and all of a sudden they were selling racks and racks of, of potted herbs weekly, uh, because we knew that market. I understood the market. I, I knew what people were going to be looking for, and um, and it clicked. It clicked right away, um, and we kept on having to add greenhouses, and and stores would call us and ask if we could, um, you know, start supplying them. And we got to the point where we had to uh, have certain criteria of, you know, of of stores and and credit worthiness, and you know what volume, and it had to be on our route. And we slowly uh, charted out a, a route um, to make these stops. Um, Pay and actually we do we do something that very few farms they don't understand we charge for delivery <laughs> if, if if my truck stops and sells you something I charge you for that service we offer a service we're delivering produce and guess what all the big wholesalers do the same thing all right they charge you for a stop um, <clears throat> it's a nominal amount. Uh, that we charge, and we don't do it in the immediate sales area, like if you're within uh, 15 miles of the farm. But once we get beyond that, we start charging money, and it pays. Uh, it pays for the fuel. It pays for the truck. It pays. It pays for the driver over time. And the more stops we were plugging in, because the day became you know more profitable just from all the add-on charges. But it was really it was a break-even thing. Some years we actually do make money of fuel. The years that fuel prices go down, uh, we do well because we don't change our rate. When they go up, we have to. It's more of a break-even proposition. But when I tell farmers that we charge for delivery, they they look at me with like that deer in the headlight look. <laughs> I, like, I just had that expression on my face. You just couldn't see it, Howard. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought we were skyping this. Oh, aren't we? <laughs> I. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, that, you know, I, I did that because that was one of the things that I learned being in business, you know, at the bottom of an invoice, I would see, uh, you know, for, it started out as fuel surcharge, right? And now it's just, it's, now it's just a delivery charge. It's the bottom line of, of every incoming invoice for, for goods that I used to get. And I still get deliveries from some of my suppliers. And if, if I don't meet certain minimums, I say, yes, yeah, $25 to drop off whatever I'm getting. And so I push back on it, but you know, even we, we, we charge if somebody orders, you know, $300 or they order $3,000, I still, I still charge for the delivery. And you know, I've never had one person, well, actually I had one person in all the years uh, complain. And guess what? We finally dropped him because I was tired of like, I was tired of him trying to weasel me, you know, constantly for a nominal stop charge. But everybody else, because what they do, they don't even, 
Uh, you know, I got to understand, they don't put this in as the cost of the goods. Most stores have a separate category. It's called, you know, shipping and receiving. It's a different category. Uh, and they enter it there because they know goods take, you know, they have to pay for shipping. So it doesn't go in even to the price structure of how they do the markup. They use doing the regular markup because they mark up all their products the same way with, and all those other companies are charging them deliveries. So farms that don't charge for deliveries are basically walking away from a helpful fee. Now, if it's all just local, then you're not going to charge. But we have a route and, you know, some, some of our, uh, a truck could go out and it could drive uh, 300 uh, miles, 300, 400 miles in a day. So it, it does add up and, it, and it's worked out good. I maintain a really good modern fleet of trucks. Uh, we've never <clears throat> missed a delivery. Uh, dependability uh, is, is paramount to retail stores. If they know every Wednesday we show up with a delivery, they know it's going to come. And it's it's vital. So we do maintain, we, we bring in the trucks regularly. Uh, we, we've we replaced trucks and, and got, you know, newer trucks and brand new trucks. I've never regretted buying brand new equipment, never, either for the farm or uh, or for the on the road, um, you know, you you're, you're buying, you're paying for dependability, and uh, but there's a value in that. And I always say, you know, what do you, what is the value? What do you what are you trying to do as a business? If you're trying to be reliable, dependable, and in, and this is what you need to do. You have to have reliable, dependable trucks and and vehicles to to get the goods to. Uh, you know, it's our lifeline. It's our blood. All right, getting. Getting, getting our goods to the store, that's our blood, all right? That's our lifeline. Uh, so we try to maintain good bloodlines. And I, I look at it, it's all one big living unit. The farm is a, is, is a whole. Uh, the customer is a part of it. We, we tend, I, I like to think that we're partnering with our uh, retail accounts. We do demos. We work with them. We email out our availability. We let them know the quality and what they're going to get. And it's always true to what we represent. We rarely have a, a complaint about about anything. Um, so there's no misrepresentation of what I do. We, I say to be tell people, you know, say what you're going to do and do what you say. And that and that's what we do. You know, we try to live up to our standards. And uh, we're known as we're a premium uh, farm. We have premium produce, premium plants. Uh, we're not trying to fill the cheap slot. That's not our position. Uh, I'm, I'm happy when people say, "Wow, you you guys are expensive," and then I would say, "Compared to what?" You know. <laughs> so we might be slightly pricey, but on the other hand, we're competitive for the for the level of product that we offer. And for some people, we're actually it seems like we're we're low price. We're we're under the competition. Uh, because some stuff gets trucked in from far away, and and we're not the far away guys. We're the local people, and there's a value in that. There's no shrinkage with our product uh, because it's fresh, and we're delivering it with our own trucks, so there's no accidents along the way. You know, the box didn't get turned upside down, and uh, there's no surprises for the retailers, and and that's been that's been key. Um, we respect the retailers business goals, which is to make money, and we try to help them make money. We're happy that they make money on our stuff. If they double the price of what they buy from us, that, it thrills me because I know that's a store that, that knows how to make, make margins and make profit, and they're going to be in business, and their checks won't bounce. You know, if you're selling to some, some, somebody who's got, you know, selling the stuff real cheap, it's like, okay, well, let me know how that goes. So, it you know everything it's something of a double edged sword being a farmer means wearing many hats wearing being a business person being a retailer being a marketer uh being a grower being hr to your staff you know all the normal things being the weatherman and you know being the soil scientist and and not that I'm good at all of those things but I've managed to be good enough in a bunch of those things uh to make to make it work and um Getting a well-rounded education uh, to become a farmer, I think, has always been in, important to me. Learning, learning bi- business and and doing various jobs uh, over the years that I've done it all. You all bring that forward. All that experience comes forward with you and to how you uh, run your operation. Uh, attending seminars has always been uh, important. 
early on. Uh, my local extension agent dragged me to various uh, fruit and vegetable uh, conventions and shows. And um, was when I used to go back in the 70s, I used to be like the youngest guy there, and I would look at all these old guys, right? It's like, wow, all these old farmers. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, you know, now me and my buddies, we're the, we're the old guys in the room. And we look at all these young kids and go, wow, look at all those young kids. So it definitely seems to be more young people. But back to the point of seminars and education, uh, it never ends. And although I've never went I, to a seminar or a workshop uh, that I didn't learn at least one good thing that was valuable to me, one tip, one trick, one or pick up a catalog that sold things that I thought were really going to be helpful or met somebody that knew something. And uh, so everything you go to, it's an education. Education never ends. Um, and and you're, you know, you're, you always wind up paying for your education or lack of an education. So you always, I, I feel, you know, paying for a seminar, it, there's a value in it. You know, it's an ongoing uh, professional growth. It's a value. Every business budgets for uh, professional growth, and so should a farm. You should always have an allotment um, for attending seminars or traveling or doing an overnight if you have to or paying for online courses. Uh, I see some people complain about, you know, the cost of, I, I see various people making, you know, businesses of, of doing seminars, on farm seminars and, and video chats and all this thing. And, you know, if you don't want to pay, don't pay, don't go. But for the, those who do, I've never met anybody who regretted attending or paying for for something that they they got a lot of value out of. Um, so I have no problem with anybody doing that at all. You know, that educational stuff, that doesn't rust, rot, or depreciate, right? That retains its value. Once you learn that skill or learn those concepts, that's something you get to use for the next 40 years on your farm. It's not going to wear out. No, it doesn't. And um, it's lightweight luggage. You take it with you <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Where, wherever you go. And you know, as I know, I, I think I, I've explained to you, I, I do some international travel and education around the world. And what school is that? I could take that knowledge um, and a few tools with me. And I've, it's opened up a whole new whole world to me. I, I've traveled all over the world doing what I do. Um, and it's exciting. And when I started, of course, I, you know, I, I never thought I would pretty much, if I left the state of Vermont, it was like a big deal. But now I... I'll jump on a jet and I'll be 13 hours in the air and I'll wind up on the other side of the world. And this is all an opportunity that presented itself because, you know, I'm farming. So, I, I, you know, like I said, like I said earlier, things evolve. You don't know what's what's going to happen. And, um, you know, it's always good to keep an open mind. To pivot back a little bit to the to the business side of things, you were talking about this idea that, you know, you need to grow stuff that sells, but you've also got to grow stuff that sells at a price that you can make money at. And I'm curious in all of these different marketplaces that you're in, how do you go about setting your prices? Because you talk about, about supplying things at a premium price and you know, that's always, I don't know, there's such a balancing act there. And you've been at it for well over 40 years now. How are you actually, when it comes down to how much to charge for a potted rosemary plant, how do you put those numbers together? Um, well, you know, sometimes you do head into these things slightly blind, um, you know, with a bit of a gut, uh, and, and then you backtrack that, you know, and you, you see at the end of the year, you know, how you did, and then, and then you, you extrapolate your margins and then you could, you, uh, parse out, you know, your cost. Um, it, it's sometimes, it's hard to sometimes go forward, uh, to, to project. Uh, everything. When I originally started um, in my plant business, I had a general idea of um, what other what I've seen other plants in other areas uh, go for, and I used that as a as a target. I, I can't say that I actually costed out each pot in the beginning. I eventually did uh, know my costs better, and once once you establish your costs. And but costs, so, you know, there's potting soil, there's pots, there's trays, there's heat, there's utilities, there's gas for delivery. So all the costs involve labor, and um, you categorize the item, and and you could, uh, if you track your hours, you could actually figure out your cost per hour per 
uh, per item. You can figure out your production per hour per work. Or we actually do it per worker to figure out which workers actually have higher levels of production, and we this way we could guide them into where we want. But then we set standards. Okay, here's here's the average. You know, average worker could do 25 trays an hour. That's the standard. That's what you got to meet. And so that's. That's how that works. But going back to the to the cost and how we, you know, figured out the margins. Uh, again, in the beginning, we I really didn't know to be truthful, Chris. It was like at the end of the year, it's like, oh, I got money left. I guess I did okay. Um, and but then we got more sophisticated at it, and we actually do run like very complicated spreadsheets now uh, to to track uh, all the, all the different items and all the different customers. Uh, but you know you do the best you can when you start you, you know you've got to there has to be the end result where if you're going to a retail store it's got to be priced uh attractively enough so that the re- that the customer the end customer the end user will purchase it from the store all right so there's got to be a margin there and you sort of work backwards from there okay if they're selling it for 3.99 and but they're paying me uh you know 250 can i make or you know, two or whatever. Can I make money from that per unit? And and you figure it out. Um, but I or very early on, I realized even like in 1974, when I started selling bedding plants, you now you would grow a head of lettuce in the field, which means you know, starting in a tray, and I would transplant it and weed it, and then cut it and wash it and bring it to the farmers market and to a store. And I was getting, you know, back then, maybe 50 cents, 75 cents for a head of lettuce. But I realized, wait a minute, I could sell a a six-pack or four-pack of lettuce plants, and I'm selling it for $2. I'm getting 50 cents for the plant in a a pack, and I didn't have to do any of that work. I just had to water it, you know, transplant it in the pack, water it, and I sold it. And I cut out all that transplanting in the field and the weeding, so I... Early on, I realized the difference in margins was was you know a factor of ten, and um, I estimated each you know each three thousand square foot greenhouse replaced at least an acre, if not several acres of profit of cash to me. So that's why I focused really early on. Um, back in the seventies, I started selling plants and produce, and I was able to finance my business just from my early spring plants. Uh, and I, so I, I was no longer borrowing money from the bank to uh, finance my the operation to buy what I needed to do, you know, the fertilizer or the compost, whatever it is I was buying. I, I didn't need that that money anymore. I had enough cash flow just to to generate uh, and go forward. So I built my first greenhouse, and back in the day, I there weren't a lot of good greenhouses up in this area. Most of them were made out of wood or they were funky and this and that. I put up the first steel frame greenhouse, one of the first. It was 30, 30 by 100. And I remember, you know, the farmers would come and look and wow, you know. <laughs> and now, of course, it's like one of my smallest greenhouses, but I still use it. And, um, but I, I, made, I made money from that. And um, most, most successful vegetable farms that I know uh, have a combination of doing plants and doing produce. It, it, uh, it, it's a balance that works financially uh, for me. Did that answer the question, Chris? I don't know. Yeah, it did in a sort in a sideways sort of fashion. So with the transplant business, what kind of season are you running on that? Because just following your Instagram feed, it looks like you guys had stuff started back in December in those greenhouses. Well, yeah. Well, cer- certain things we keep year round. We do our own stock plants because. Uh, one of the things we have is unique varieties. And in this business, the nursery or greenhouse business, you, you find out that things come, certain things get discontinued by from the source and you can't get them anymore. Certain varieties of creeping lemon thyme or scented geraniums or certain things that we really like. So we found, we learned to keep our own stock plants um, and so we could produce our own varieties and keep those lines uh, going. So we do keep our stock plants of scented geraniums over the winter and um, some of the the, uh, the herbs as stock plants. You might have seen uh, we were doing tomatoes. I seeded uh, tomatoes in December, 
And but I did that for training for staff because we do grafting, and I'm training some new staff uh, on on how to successfully do tomato grafts. And um, so that's why we did that, and we're into our third now uh, training session of, of grafting. We just did a batch yesterday, and um, we just seeded the main crop of actual uh, graft tomatoes yesterday. We seeded about a thousand max of fort at a buck of seed. So these are expensive things. That's why training is is um, crucial because we want to get a high percentage of success. You know, and we, we've had 99% success rate, we call it take rate, of successful grafts, which is really high. Um, some farms, like if they get 75, 80%, they think, that, you know, that's usually, that's normal. But we, so we really push because at a buck of seed, you, you really got to nail this uh, to make it, make it worthwhile. And the grafting, the early grafting of tomatoes is a pretty nice chunk of change for us. We supply other farmers as well as our own uh, needs. Uh, so that that so we do we we do keep the group one of the greenhouses going uh, year round, um, and then but basically the season really starts in February for us where we're seeding uh, herbs and and uh, get into the whole thing. But I've got strawberries that I seeded and they just sprouted yesterday. Um, so some things we start really early, but the greenhouse is going anyway, and it just gets folded into you know I, we've had some expensive weeks. Uh, <laughs> propane wise uh i think our worst week i think i spent eight hundred nine hundred dollars like about a month ago uh for the week between heating the barn and heating uh one and a half greenhouses um but now it's down it's down a lot the weather's changed and um the days are getting longer uh and the season averages out all i know for the last five years chris our energy use by the end of the year has actually gone down every year for the last five years uh, because the cost of fuel's gone down, uh, we've gotten more efficient, um, and it just, it's one of the things that have actually gone down in price. Um, so I never, some people just panic over energy use, and I never, I never made a big deal out of it. I do the best I can, but I, I don't let it stop the business because, um, it wasn't, energy use is not that big a percentage of my business at all. It's a pretty small, chunk of change compared to almost anything else we buy so it's not a big problem labor is a big problem not not energy use um so yeah the season starts say it kicks in in february we start with a small crew and then you know march we're really starting to kick in and april we're full tilt i've got uh a flat filling machine that's pretty automated although it's a mix we do a mix of hand and and equipment uh usage here uh, we're not totally automated. I've seen a lot more advanced businesses, uh, greenhouse businesses that just uh, totally automated, and I'm you know super impressed with that. But the way my our layout is here, we don't have one huge greenhouse. We've got ten individual greenhouses and sort of spread out, um, you know, in a bit of a little an area here. It just doesn't lend itself to huge automation. Um, we still water by hand, though. Uh, drips in the field. We do some drips in the greenhouse for our hanging baskets and things. But it's a combination of hand work and, and machinery. We transplant by hand. Uh, we have equipment to do seeding, vacuum seeders, and that was, that's a huge thing. We could just, you know really knock out the trays of lettuce and brassicas and whatever uh, with the vacuum seeders. That was a big step forward. But it's a, it's a mix. We, we just get good and focused on what we do. Focus is what the key is. We don't try to be everything to everybody. Um, we're really, really focused on, on um, certain lines of goods. We don't. We discontinued a lot of baskets of hanging flowers that we used to do. Um, just too much problems with insects, um, and it was taking away too much light from my herbs and my tomato plants. So we got rid of most of the hanging baskets. Now we do strawberry baskets. We do early strawberries um, that we start picking in uh, the end of April out of hanging baskets uh, for the farmer's market. So, you know, it's like I said earlier, things evolve. The business goes certain ways. And at the peak where you know, there's 19 people working here, transplanting, moving plants, watering plants, delivering plants, it's all about the plants. The, the plants for us make over well over half the amount of income. I tell people by the middle of June, if I stop farming, I'm fine. If 
financially. We've already made our money. I don't, you know, we grow vegetables because we love growing vegetables. Um, and I like to, and people here like to work outside and, uh, I like to do it personally, but financially, um, the margin starts just start shrinking as soon as we're, we've shipped out our last flat of plants uh, somewhere in July. I mean, you talk about focusing on certain crops. I know that you're not a grow everything vegetable farm. What sorts of things have you ended up focusing on out in the field? Yeah, we're not we're not a market gardener. If I had a full time retail stand, it would be a little different. You know, then we would be growing lettuce and things. But when I got into this, I realized certain things I didn't want to do. One is I didn't, because I used to do everything. Okay. Back in the seventies and eighties, we did A to Z. I grew everything. Um, before people were growing everything, I, we were growing everything. Um, and I learned, I didn't want to do that again. I didn't want to be picking say cucumbers off of the ground every day. I didn't want to be cutting lettuce. I didn't want to grow things that wilted or had to be picked every day or that had to bend down very much to pick them. I didn't want to pick peas again. I figured, you know, let other people do that. Um, There's just no no margins in it for me. I didn't want to do it. So we focused on commodities that were stable commodities that uh, were good for the fall when I would start shipping mums. We used to have a big uh, fall mum potted mum business and we would fill truckloads of that and I would start, okay, well, we're already going to these stores, so let's put in bags of onions and uh, winter squash. So those were the first two key commodity crops that we grew. Uh, We got into the onion business and then the garlic business, which I always did all along, but I, I expanded that radically. So these were all stable crops that didn't wilt. You could pick them when you when they were ready and when you had the time. And that was the other thing was the amount of time because of the, the growth of the greenhouse business. I really didn't have the crew ready in the spring to go out and plant all these other early season uh, crops because we're busy making money with our plants in the greenhouses. So I, I um, went to squash. We could do, you know, set those out at the end of May. Uh, onions were uh, the only radical shift of we. We try to get those out early, but I have transplanters. I have equipment that do it pretty efficiently. So once the weather is right and I get the field ready correctly, uh, within two or three days, we could set out a couple hundred thousand um, onions, and just and, and then that's done. So the, we're into the commodities, stable crops, onions, uh, winter squash. You know, people say oh, there's not a lot of money in winter squash, and it's like. Well, you know, sometimes quantity has a quality of all of its own, and we grow a lot of winter squash. So, and we we get a decent enough price, and we our yields are outstanding. So we make money on winter squash, and labor wise for us, it it fits our bill. Um, same thing with with onions. Uh, it's a high value crop for us. Uh, you know, anytime you're getting fifty, seventy five dollars for a bushel of anything out of the field, that's a good crop, and uh, you know, for us, that's that's what we get. You know, we get some things we're getting two hundred dollars a bushel for out of the field. Uh, some of the specialty onions, uh, and then garlic, of course, is is a whole whole different animal. You know, a bushel of uh, properly cured premium sized garlic is worth five, six, seven hundred dollars. You know, talk to other vegetable farmers, and you tell them, "Oh, I got a, bu- a bushel of something here, and I get seven hundred dollars," and they look at you like. You know, their eyes bug out, you know, it's like, is that legal? It's like, yeah, it's all legal. <laughs> well, and you can, and it's a lot of fun to put that kind of stuff on the truck too. I remember doing that with shallots, you know, a hundred dollars for a half bushel of shallots. And absolutely, you know, these, these, are high. I love writing, writing up invoices where the single line entry says, you know, $560 and you're doing that multiple times. It's like, um, so after a while it became that the tail was wagging the dog we decided to drop the mums, <laughs> um, even though it, you know, that was a bit of a heartbreaker. And the flat, the one flat field where we grew the mums, we put up another greenhouse. Right. And we, <laughs> and and what we we actually, as a memory, we call that house because we name all the houses that's mum house. So that's <laughs> that's as close to we get as growing mums now. As it's the name is still there. Um, but then we, now we just fill up the truck with onions, winter squash, uh, bags of carrots or bunch carrots, 
that's about the only freshish you know item we do sort of bunch carrots um but we we do a few other things we we're doing strawberries we got into that and that's been nice we do greenhouse cucumbers that's been a nice addition uh we don't do a lot of high tunnel crops vegetable crops like i see a lot of people do we don't do greens i didn't want to get involved in building and maintaining the sanitation necessary to uh pass and we do we are gap certified but i just didn't want to deal with it um it's just uh, it's just I, I didn't want to deal with fresh greens again it violated my my wilting clause i i didn't want to build uh grow things that were going to wilt and had to get rid of that day it didn't meet, meet my shipping schedules but we have walked in coolers uh we grow raspberries in the greenhouses to maturity we have two tunnels that we grow uh fall raspberries in and we start picking those uh third week of July and that's a, a nice been a nice item for us but you know the interesting thing about that we also grow bedding plants in those greenhouses before the raspberry comes up oh really so we actually, oh yeah uh because you know the raspberries aren't up yet we, we we cut them all down to the ground these are um floribunda raspberries we we cut them down to the ground and so we have this empty greenhouse space so we install heaters and we fill it with bedding plants so we make a lot more money on the bedding plants before the raspberries come up. We've already made our money in that raspberry house, and the raspberries are sort of a bonus. But what's nice about raspberries in the tunnel, we don't have very much SWD. There's very little mold because they're not getting rained on. On a rainy day, we could pick raspberries and bring them to the farmer's market. I know the growers can. So it's been in the size of them because we're controlling the fertility well, and, and they're on drip. You know, they're they're huge. I Basic. I don't know how you know people pick raspberries. I don't know how they're making money on raspberries. When I see these vast pints of raspberries and they're tiny, and I know how long it takes to pick raspberries, and I see what they're selling them for, and I just like you know making money on that raspberry. How can you make money you know picking raspberries if you're paying people to pick them, or even for yourself, your time's got to be worth something. I know how many pints you could pick in an hour, but our raspberries, uh, you know, they're the size of nickels or some of the size of quarters, so you you could pick you know, and actually make some money out of it. And they're huge and they're delicious um, and clean because they're inside. These are the kind of things we, we've done along the way is uh, focus and grow unique things. Now, with those raspberries, is that something that you're also selling wholesale or is that strictly a farmer's market crop for you? Well, we were wholesaling it because um, we expanded a, a bunch on it and because the farmer's market is only one day a week and then we have a roadside small roadside stand we were exceeding the production so we started we do wholesale some of it but when we really were pushing the pencils actually just this last winter uh we realized that we're losing money on every pint of raspberries that we wholesaled so um we're going to be cutting back uh i actually we're ripping out one of the raspberry houses and i'm going to be converting that to more tomatoes and uh, and cucumbers um just to limit it We'll only do raspberries. The only money you can make on raspberries for us is to direct sell them for the best possible price. So that's what we're going to do. I'm not going to wholesale them any longer. Uh, so that that's the power of pushing, of tracking, uh, you know, picking hours, yield per person, and the pricing. So that that's where the spreadsheets become valuable. And just to to get down in the weeds, when you're doing that kind of tracking, how do you actually get that job done? When you're looking at at somebody's per hour productivity on raspberries, for example? Well, they pick every day. Uh, we have, they, they fill out a form. Uh, the several forms drives people crazy. I mean, people punch in and out. We have a time clock. Um, but we have uh, daily sheets and then specific crop sheets. So they'll be, okay, I, uh, there's a raspberry sheet. I started picking at 9 30 and I pick 36 or 48 or whatever it is, half pints of, um, of berries. Uh, so we have that data. Now that data has to get inputted into uh, a spreadsheet. And we haven't been able to sort and to mechanize that part of the data input. And I'm going to be working on that, uh, this year. So that's been a bit of a log jam. Um, Fighting people, we have to fight people's inclination of not wanting to write down stuff. But once they learn the importance of it, they they understand and they get into it. 
But then entering the data, you know, it just becomes a tsunami of information. This is true. But once you get your baseline of how many pints per hour somebody should be able to pick, it, it makes it easy to set the guidelines for, for new pickers. And like, okay, this is what you got to do. And then just run the numbers of, um, we, cause we have the invoices, we track the invoices, we enter the sales. So it's, it's not that hard to do, you know, for, for any particular crop. It's really just a matter of taking the time to, to stand back and do that management work of figuring out. It is. You can't do this on the fly. And, you know, I always, oh, you know, my gut's telling me we're making money on this. Well, you know, so lots of times your gut's lying to you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and, and maybe you only have, like, gas. It's not really the truth. <laughs> you think you're... <laughs> you're the, the value of really doing the books is is a value all of its own, and I'm not great at it. My wife has done 99% of it. I, I got dragged into bookkeeping. I, I got dragged into it screaming and kicking, to be to be honest. Um, most far, if, most, if farmers love bookkeeping, they would be bookkeepers. They would be doing something else. They wouldn't be farming. You know, what, what do we like to do? We like to sit on a tractor. Who doesn't? You know, that's fun. You know, sitting at the desk, typing in, you know, and, and doing a spreadsheet and typing stuff in and making sure it's in the right column and the formula is set and, you know, drop and drag and click and drag. And, you know, who loves that stuff? You really just have to be like zoned into it, understand what the outcome is going to be. It's going to be valuable. You make more money doing bookkeeping than you do farming, all right? Because you'll learn the mistakes, you'll learn what makes money, and that's where good decisions are going to come from. So, you know, just if you're just doing what you like, um, could put you out of business quickly. So sometimes you got to do what you don't like. It's like it's like eating your spinach. <laughs> I like spinach. Bad analogy, but for some, maybe broccoli. You know, if you don't like a particular vegetable, sometimes you, you got to eat that vegetable because it really is is going to be good for you. With that, we're going to stop here. Take a quick break. Get a quick word from a couple of sponsors, and then we'll be right back with Howard Prusak from High Meadows Farm in Putney, Vermont. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Farmer's Web, software for your farm. Farmer's Web makes it easy to work with your buyers, saving you time, increasing efficiency, reducing mistakes, and streamlining order management. Farmer's Web helps you manage orders from buyers who place them online and also those that order by phone or email. Use Farmer's Web to generate a product catalog for buyers, allow buyers to view your real-time availability online, and create harvest lists and packing slips for your orders. Farmers Web helps you inform your buyers of delivery routes, pickup locations, lead times, and more, while helping you keep track of special pricing and customer information. You can also download detailed financial reports. Farmers Web offers a free account type and a flat monthly fee on paid plans. You can pause, cancel, or switch plan types at any time. Check out a demo video and Farmers Web guide to working with wholesale buyers at farmersweb.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is also brought to you by Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light potting mixes. Vermont Compost potting soils are a really special product. I used Vermont Compost Fort V as a blocking mix and potting soil for over 12 years on my farm, and we grew some great transplants with it. And I mean really great transplants, year after year after year. And at a time in the organic movement when we're seeing more and more companies jumping on the bandwagon, Vermont Compost is a reminder of the art and the craft of making potting soil. They mix an incredible diversity of ingredients into the compost that forms the basis of their potting soil, incorporating many kinds of manures along with plant materials and food waste. And all of these things together foster structure and aeration in the compost, which goes further in when you put it into a potting soil. I love that their Fort V mix even has chips of ocean blue granite in it and a little bit of kelp for a little smell of the ocean. One thing I've always appreciated about Vermont Compost is their ability to put out a consistent product year after year. And in something that's subject to as many variables as market farming, it's nice to have something you can count on. VermontCompost.com. All right. And we're back with Howard Prusak from High Meadows Farm in Putney, Vermont. So Howard, I'd, I'd like to dig in because you're obviously somewhat of an expert on transplant production and it's, it's that time of year now. Yeah. What's the magic sauce? What are the secrets? What, what is it that you do better than anybody else to make money growing potted plants on your farm? Well, I don't know if I do it better than anybody else. I'm, I'm sure there, you know, there are a lot of good growers. 
um, in this business. Obviously, there are. Uh, what what we do, what any successful grower to do is um, is pay attention uh, to the fundamentals and the details. Um, use uh, we use a sterile mix for germination for the most part. Um, it depends on, especially herbs, vegetables. It's not as important. We use a we use a well prepared uh, compost potting soil for most most of the vegetables, like any of the brassicas and spinach. Those things are no brainers. They're like weeds. They're like planting pigweed um, to to germinate. Um, the the key is is heat. Uh, having good bottom heat and adequate moisture to get the seed to germinate. You could either do it in a germination chamber or we have heated propagation tables that we built using um, micro rubber tubing running to a hot water boiler. And we heat these benches uh, to the mid 70s degrees to keep the soil warm. And that's key. Um, you want things to germinate properly and, and quickly. And then we use plugs. We either do plugs or open trays uh, in 20 row trays, depending on, on what it is uh, we're growing. If it has to be pricked out individually or for maximum speed, we do plugs. We have plug poppers uh, and we're just popping these things out and then and banging them into, uh, uh, into trays uh, for vegetable starts. So using good, good potting soil, we've tried making our own and it's, you, it's very hard because you can't get consistency of, of product. We don't have the right mixers to really blend uh, the peat and and the limestone, whatever it is you're blending to make your own potting soil. Um, it's it's really hard. I've seen people try it and 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 they'll lose they'll lose everything. Uh, they put too much or unfinished compost in with peat and they mix it. And, and the stuff gets too hot because it's still cooking or it's not sterile and everything gets moldy. Um, there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of ways to kill plants. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that's, that's the bottom line. Uh, um, or they don't vent there, you know, they'll start, they'll, I've seen people start stuff in cold frames or hot frames and because they don't have greenhouses yet or they don't want to build a greenhouse or heat a greenhouse and, and they don't realize the sun comes up and that these things will fry. Most pe- more people lose plants from too much heat than freezing, Chris. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an amateur mistake that I've seen time and time again. They'll build a greenhouse, but they won't put a vent fan in because, well, why would you do that? You know, you don't need a vent fan. So, these, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheels. There are books and magazines and catalogs that show you uh, well-built greenhouses and, and how to do them. Um, don't, re, you know, don't reinvent the wheel is always a, a motto, a mantra of mine. Yeah, I always say you're something smarter than me has already had to deal with this. I'll, I'll find that person. I'll find what they, how they did it, and um, and that's how I learn almost you know everything that I do uh, was from you know a good idea is worth stealing, <laughs> and and that's that's what we do. You know we so the fundamentals uh, give give them heat, give them moisture. Don't let things dry out. Don't let them get too hot. Uh, and know the in, and some things don't need to be covered with soil. We don't use soil to cover our seeds. We, for the most part, use vermiculite. Some people have a problem with vermiculite, and that's you know you can make that decision. I don't have a problem with it. Been using it for 40 years. Uh, it's a sterile, nice, even covering. It's easy to apply. Uh, it prevents uh, mold on top of the soil structure. Uh, the plants, the seedlings, come up through it really easy. Uh, and you could control the amount, the depth of the vermiculite you do over the seedling. So that's why we, we use vermiculite. We use a, a medium to coarse grain, not the fine grain uh, vermiculite. Uh, that's, that's, what we, that's what we use primarily. A uh, sterile potting mix, we use, um, it's a commercial compost-based potting mix uh, we get from New York State called McEnroe. Uh, Vermont Compost Company makes an excellent mix. I'm old friends with Carl Hammer, who owns a company up there. But we get McEnroe because it's convenient for where it's on our distribution route, so we could pick it up. But they're both good products. Um, and I think 
Carl, I know, ships out west uh, truckloads of his product. But there's other equivalent ones. And then we use, a, we use sterile organic um, just peat-based mixes for our more sensitive herbs that don't want compost. Cer- some herbs just don't like compost, um, and you've got to learn uh, which ones those are. So that's that's how we do it. We, you know, the tiny seeds, we're careful. We don't plant too thick. We keep an eye on fungal diseases. We use root shield at transplant time. Um, but keeping at an air, ventil- air ventilation and air circulation in greenhouses is crucial. We use uh, HAF fans uh, throughout all the greenhouses that are constantly moving uh, some air around. Um, that's really important. And, um, and and looking at the plants daily, uh, we're always checking on the crucial area. The propagation house is where I spend most of my time uh, in the spring uh, watching my, my babies, I, I call them, on the heated propagation tables, uh, watering them when they need it. We use misters, automatic misters on tables where we're doing cuttings and some seeds uh, that that don't need to be covered but want to be kept moist and that helps a lot you got to keep keep an eye on on everything it's a it's a business that takes just a lot of babysitting constantly um so it's 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 not for the faint-hearted being in this business but it it, it can be a nice home-based business uh has been for me um i walk out my door and i'm at work <laughs> uh some people may not like that but it works for me Tell me about teaching people to water, because obviously with 30,000 square feet of heated greenhouses where you're doing potted production, you're not doing all of the watering yourself. But I always found that was one of the hardest things to, to teach people how to get right. It is. Uh, and some people are just no good at it. Uh, and so you got to watch them. And I've had to pull people off and say, you know, let's find something better for you to do. Um, and so you got to be be careful with that. Now, how do you do it? You've got to work with them. You know, they got to follow you around for a half hour. You got to watch them for a half hour. You got to go back with them over what they watered and, and pull up some plants, pull up some pots and look and teach them because it is, it is tricky. Uh, you can't overwater, you can't underwater, though I, underwatering is definitely safer than overwatering. There's two types of growers. Chris, I don't know if you've heard this term of being, are you a dry grower or are you a wet grower? Right. And, and it doesn't refer to somebody has a drinking problem. <laughs> um, it really, it, I know. When I first heard it, I'm thinking, huh? But then you get it. There's some, you know, you learn some growers, uh, it, it's, do you like to keep things on the dry side? Or are you a wet grower and you like to keep things things wet? Well, it depends on your facility and, and, and the plants. I, I definitely, myself, I try to be on the dry side for the most part. I find there's less trouble uh, you, if you're on the wet side and if your greenhouse is, isn't heat enough, you get uh, various uh, root diseases or fungal problems, which you don't get so much if you're, if you're, on, if you're a dry water, or especially being organic. It's, it's, it's uh, more, more important. So you've got to work with them to teach them the watering. They have to have the right hose and the right spray pattern gentle, but it's putting out enough water so that we're actually getting a job done. Could have a good water source, uh, good hoses. We have, for the most part, in most of the houses, they're all high hoses, so they're off the floor, and um, so you're not dragging hoses around, and um, it's not easy teaching somebody uh, to water. You're right. It's a hard job. You know, a friend of mine joked that if you, you know, you want to find, find the owner of a greenhouse, follow the hose. And at the end of it, you'll find the owner. Uh, and, and this is true. And it gets, you know, you get these really hot uh, weeks or days in May. And and it's like basically by the time you're done watering a various range, you almost have to start over again uh, or at least do some spot watering. So it, it's, it's, it's a real, you know, it's a high labor part of the job. I'm going to be installing... Um, and one or two of the houses and overhead. Now that I got rid of the hanging baskets, I'm going to be able to install a better uh, watering system to take away. Um, don't do a perfect job overhead watering, but what it does, it, it's a it's a safety valve for you. So um, it'll at least it'll at least take care of some of the watering, and that's a big deal. But yeah, every year finding enough good people to water uh, and training, it's um, it's. 
one of the problems. That's why I'm putting people on salary now to maintain more year-round steady employee, employers. Well, I have people coming back. I've got one person been here 17 years now, another one uh, six years. Uh, so keeping good employees is, is really crucial for me. So watering, you're right, is hard. Seeding is hard. Um, though I found that's even easier than teaching watering, you know, teaching proper seeding rates and how to do it. Uh, that's not as hard as getting a good waterer. You are correct. Now, some people automate and have bottom watering. I don't have that system. Uh, I envy people with that. Uh, we have rolling benches on most of my greenhouses to give us maximum uh, space. So very little uh, space is wasted in empty aisles. And that's one of the ways we've got our production uh, way way higher than most. So we can have average greenhouse, we're getting a third more amount of plants in it than if we didn't have rolling benches. So we and, and we turn our benches at least twice each greenhouse. So an average greenhouse could produce fifty thousand dollars worth of plants for us in three months. You and you know, thirty five hundred or four thousand square feet. You can't do that on four thousand square feet of, of of vegetables. <laughs> Not legally. That's right. How are you ventilating your greenhouses? How are you controlling that temperature? You mentioned earlier that you've got propane, I think forced air heat for the for keeping things warm, but then when it turns into cooling, how are you getting that job done? Well, some of the houses, the older houses have a thermostatically controlled uh, exhaust fans and air intakes on the opposite end of the greenhouse. Now, I always use uh, engineered uh, specs for what size fans and how many fans to get in those greenhouses. You want to be able to turn the cubic footage of a greenhouse um, as quickly as possible when you want to vent. Um, and you want to get, and you know, you can only get the temperature down to within five degrees of the outside temperature. You know, no matter how you vent the greenhouse, because it's just going to be warmer in there. Um, so when it gets really hot. We do shading, but the older houses have fans. I don't do that anymore on any of the newer houses. We do overhead venting. We have either single butterfly openings on the top and roll up sides to take care of the venting needs on one of the bigger house. We have like a double butterfly that opens on both sides on the top of the greenhouse. And when that's open fully and you roll up the sides, you're pretty well vented. Uh, at, a, at a really nice rate, a gentle uplift um, in air. Um, it was, we've one, we do those manually. I, I have a thermostat to install on, on a couple of the bigger houses. I just haven't, haven't gotten around to doing that, but I have a thermal alarm, so it lets me know about, about uh, the heat. So I have, and staff is trained, I, you know, of, of how to open and close these things. So uh, that that's how we vent it. So I don't use any fans on any of the newer houses anymore for venting. It's all through openings in the top of the greenhouse, which takes a little more complicated structure, uh, and it's hard to redo the older structures. But luckily, most of my houses are fairly new now, so we'd have the top venting, and I, I like that a real lot. Just quieter, too. No, the exhaust fans, it's like, you know, you hear those suckers. Um, and uh, it's not, and, and they act, the greenhouses act as giant dehydrators. So we do use that to actually dry down uh, our garlic crop in one of those houses, and it works great. Um, but but we, like, we like natural ventilation. And then before we turn to our lightning round, I did want to ask you about the overseas work that you did. You alluded to that earlier. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Because that seems to be a really important part of your world right now. It means a lot to me. Um, it, it, I've made friends overseas and around the world, um, and, and um, it, it's given me amazing uh, memories. But I, that, a decade or so ago, I got contacted by um, an organization that does international uh, aid work, a training of um, low-income people throughout the world in various countries, and I was offered a chance to go to Nepal with my wife for a two-week uh, stint of training, um, working with uh, a family that had a small greenhouse nursery in uh, Hutauda, Nepal, which is almost near the Indian border. And uh, I knew nothing about Nepal. I didn't even know where it was 
You know, I was like, huh, what? And, uh, but they talked me into it and it really was a life changer for me, um, to, to visit and work with these people. And the reception that we received, and so well, basically everything's paid for. For you know, we get they arranged everything. It was really easy. I just had a, I just had to show up at the airport, and we were whisked away. You know, half a world away. It took 24 hours of traveling to get there, and you know, landing in Japan, and landing in Bangkok, and then winding up in Kathmandu. You know, and uh, even if with the airline check-in, they, they look at your ticket and they look. Kathmandu, wow, you know, that's a long trip. It is, you know, it's hard to go much further than Kathmandu from uh, from Vermont. And uh, the people were wonderful. And we worked with a bunch of people. They were walking every day, hours a day to get to our classes that we were holding. Uh, some of them were barefoot. I had one woman, they referred to her as the forest woman. She had, she had a little garden at the edge of, of the forest that she would walk two hours to get to the class every morning. Uh, that we're holding at this uh, little nursery uh, in Hatauda. And they're just wrapped at attention to learn more modern methods of germination and sterile mix and different things of what they were using. And uh, we, we showed them uh, grafting and transplanting. And we talked a lot about organics and, um, and seed varieties and, and things like that. And um, it worked so well that a year later uh, the nursery re reported back to us that he had uh, tripled his profits from where he was um, when before we got there using our methods and uh, he was so successful that the son uh, Hari uh, he was able to find a wife because uh, they do arrange marriages there and they couldn't find him a wife until he was successful enough and he, he was so proud and he showed me pictures of, of his wife and so it was you know that you get moments like that in your heart and, and to make real warm friendships is like beyond beyond words and then since then I've gone back to Nepal a couple more times uh, worked in different parts of Nepal with other growers got to ride an elephant through the rainforest I've been to South America been to El Salvador um, into I was the, one of the first Americans to go into um, Myanmar. Uh, I was there a week after uh, President Obama opened up the country, and I went way out into the countryside where I was like the first Westerner they literally had seen in 20 years, and that was a it was like the mother uh, almost otherworldly experience to be uh, holding classes inside of Buddhist uh, temples um, in in Myanmar, and um, it was really amazing. My first day there, I had to give a talk to a thousand people, and it was insane. I didn't know I was going to be doing that, and all of a sudden I landed and said, "Oh yeah, by the way, you're going to give a talk on preparing for climate change." I said, "What?" <laughs> like you know, I'm not I'm not Bill Nye, you know, <laughs> the science guy here. And uh, I put together a slide presentation and a talk, and there was it was and I I I, I they gave I have a translator and. Uh, handlers, I call them. And um, it was just, um, you know, it, it was pretty amazing. I'm going back to Nepal uh, this summer. And I, and I, I can't wait uh, for the experience. I said I've made lifelong friends and, and we, we talk and exchange emails and to see the progress people are making and the enthusiasm and just to see another world take you out of your experience. You know, I tell people like in Vermont, you know, like the poorest Vermont farmer I know would be considered a really rich, successful farm in most of these places that I go. People don't realize how well off we have it, how easy it is we have it. You know, we could pick up a catalog and pick up a phone and order, oh, you want a new cedar? Okay, I'll call up in mean, Johnny's and I'll have it in two days. Well, you can't do that, like, in these places. You know, they don't have the, the supply chains and the wherewithal and the markets development and... And all these things that we just take for granted, um, they're, you know, they're, they're looked out in awe in these other places. So it's nice to get out of our own bubble and, and see how uh, the rest of the world lives. The app, when I was there, the average income in Nepal was about $300 a year, a year, wow. okay? And I would visit, we would visit some gardens, and I find out, I would told, no, this is actually their farm. And it was like, you know, a garden, and you find out that there was seventy percent of their income was coming from this 
this little garden that the wife basically ran. In the palm, women are doing most of the gardening and farming, and uh, now the men are getting into it because the women are making money. And and they were originally they were very skeptical of um, these programs that were training women to earn money, and now they became very proud that their wives were like making money, and um, now it's it's you know the men folk are like understanding that there's money to be made growing vegetables, and uh, it's been big cultural change of um, so the the program originally was aimed at least in Nepal and uh, was training. Uh, Women, low-income women, of a way to make a you know an income and controlling the money. It was a big problem that the men were making some money, but the money wasn't coming home to the family for various reasons. I'm sure you could project as to why. And and having they realized that change poverty, the, the women in the family had the money. They'll spend it on things that the family really needs. They'll spend it on better food, uh, you know, things like that, medicine, uh, and and it really is. It's really helped a lot. So I'm, we're really proud of the work uh, that we're doing there in various countries. El Salvador, I loved. Had a great time down there. And, you know, I'm still in friends. I still have really good friends that I met in El Salvador. And I can't wait to go back there. Good coffee. <laughs> I mean, just imagine that for Vermont, you know, for an American to go visit a coffee plantation, it's just like, wow, you know, you see commercials and they see the beans, but to actually be there and, and see, you know, uh, the first time we're uh, to visit a coffee place, and it's different than what you even imagine. So we're walking through the woods, and I'm going, so where's the coffee plantation? And they go, well, you're standing in it. And you realize that, you know, these little bushes that, like, are randomly all around you, those are the coffee bushes, and they're growing them in the forest with tree cover for shade. And it just looks like you're walking through, you know, and they're not in rows. It's not like a farm that we know it. It's pretty random, you know, on, on the steep hillsides or rolling hills. And a lot, most of these places don't lend themselves to automated agriculture. You know, you can't get your tractor in these places to spray and, and this and that. So organic farming is really important to a lot of these um, coffee plantations. Uh, but we've, I visited a thousand acre coffee plantation and I was working with them on how to grow vegetables because they've lost a lot of them lost skill set of how to feed themselves. You know, you wouldn't think, but the, you know, we all know these stories of these, uh, you know, banana republics, but they're basically growing coffee for export and the people are hungry. You know, how could this be? Well, they lost their land. They lost the skill set. They don't have the means of, of growing food and we're having to re um, educate them. And so, and building gardens, and you know, look, hey, you could grow vegetables, and it's like a big revelation. You know, it's like it's amazing. You just don't think of these things from where we sit up here, drinking your cup of uh, Starbucks or, you know, your curry cup of coffee. Of really, what the end result? You know, who what the work that went into this stuff is is just mind boggling when you visit. You know, see the women picking out the beans on the assembly line and, you know, the bad beans and they're socializing and yakety yakting. It looks like so much, you know, but they're doing that for eight hours a day, sitting on a chair watching beans go by in a conveyor belt. You know, average person isn't going to do that. Well, it's just fascinating stuff to see how the other world, you know, the other parts of the world live. We, All of America lives in a bubble. I'm in my own bubble in Vermont, trust me. But I leave Vermont and I feel like I'm in a foreign country. But to actually go to a foreign country, it's like, whoa, it's like being on another planet. You know, be riding on an elephant in the rainforest uh, in Nepal, you know, is uh, is is as otherworldly as, as you could get from, from, uh, from Vermont. I would recommend it to anybody. You know, get out of your bubble, get out of your way, go go anywhere in the world. You know, don't say you've been go to other countries, but you're going to an inclusive resort in Jamaica, and don't tell me you've been, you know you've been to a third world country. You haven't. You got to get outside of yourself, get outside of the resorts. You know, rent an Airbnb in a, in a small village somewhere and, and walk around and meet people. You know, it's not scary. They they're friendly. Just smile. Smile gets you anywhere. I smile all over the world, and you get a smile back. Works works for everybody. Howard, with that, we're going to turn to our lightning round. First, we're going to get a quick word from one more sponsor. This lightning round is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are real farming equipment for real farmers. And with PTO-driven attachments like rototillers, flail mowers, rotary plows, power harrows, log splitters, snow throwers, even a utility trailer and a new water transfer pump, you've got the tools you need to get jobs done across the farm and across the homestead. On my own farm, we went through a number of so-called solutions for mowing and tilling before we finally got smart and bought a BCS. 
even though we owned a four-wheel tractor to manage our 20 acres of vegetables, that BCS tackled jobs we simply couldn't do with the larger machine, from mowing steep slopes and around trees to working in our high tunnels. Plus, they're gear-driven for years of dependable service. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments, plus videos of BCS in action. Howard, what's your favorite tool on the farm? My cell phone? <laughs> uh, <laughs> the porta potty um, <laughs> uh, that, that's the, it's a it's a gotcha moment, you know. I, I uh, tractor operated or manual. I, I love my Planet Junior three hundred A Cedar. I've been using it the same one for forty something years. I love it. Um, I, I I I love my my Rainflow mulch layer, bed maker, drip tape installer mulch layer. I love my Rainflow transplanter. And, and give me a hoe. Give me a hoe and a and a, and a rota to weed, and, and I'm happy. What's your favorite crop to grow? I, I like winter squash. Um, I like potatoes. I love I love digging potatoes. I love carrots. It's hard to have. It's like which one's my favorite kid? I know. I, I know. I, you know. I I I, I love. I, I I if I can eat it, I love it. Now, you're in a place where squash really means something there in the Northeast in a way that it just doesn't here in the Midwest. Do you have a favorite winter squash variety? My favorite squash variety is the one I make the most money on. <laughs> and that, that changes yearly. Now, I, 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 I love them all. I, I, butternut, standard butternut's great. I love um, sunshine squash. I, I love some of the more exotic squashes. Delicata. Delicata, if I guess if I had to pick one. We all seem to love that. I've been growing that one for almost 40 years. I grew that when it first came out. It was introduced as, it was sold as sweet potato squash. Did you know that? Yes, I remember that. Yeah, I got it. My first seed was from um, Stokes. They used to use the Stokes catalog way back in the day. And it was sweet potato squash. And then, oh, spaghetti squash. Yeah, it was one of the early big money makers for me back in the 70s. I got out of the Stokes catalog. I used to truck that down to New York City, and the New York Times wrote it up in an article, and I, uh, it was like printing money for me. <laughs> <laughs> On spaghetti awesome. squash, I love that. That's a talk about a different world. That's definitely a different world. Um, yeah, people were calling me up from Manhattan. <laughs> when are you coming back down? We need more of that spaghetti squash, and it grew like a weed for me. I mean, the stuff was like incredibly prolific, and there it was, and they were big, and as you know. Big, big money back then. <laughs> you know, I think I was getting 75 cents a pound down there, or maybe not even, maybe 50 cents a pound. That was big money back in 1974. I made out like a bandit loading up my little Datsun pickup and driving that down loaded with produce. It was, uh, <laughs> come back with, you know, $600 cash. That was big money. So if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Um, uh, buy Google stock. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't know. Yeah. You know, get rich quicker, I guess. <laughs> it would be the worst of the wise. I, I did all right. I didn't make too many mistakes. Make, keep, you know, my, my only bit of wisdom I tell people is be friendly to everyone. You meet the same people on the way up as you do on the way down. Make a lot of friends. Make Don't try to make enemies. Howard, thank you so much for being on the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. You're welcome, Chris. I enjoyed it. Good luck to everybody and hope you have a great growing season. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 155 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. You can find the notes for the show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Prusak. That's P-R-U-S-S-A-C-K. The transcript of this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk-behind farming equipment and high-quality garden tools in North America, and by Osborne Quality Seeds, a dedicated partner for growers. Visit OsborneSeed.com for high-quality seed, industry-leading customer service, and fast order fulfillment. Additional funding for transcripts is provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. 
Also, please head on over to iTunes. Leave us a review if you enjoyed the show or talk to us in the show notes or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. You can support the show directly by going to farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate. I am working to make the best farming podcast in the world and you can help. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmertofarmerpodcast.com and I will do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there. Keep the tractor running.